Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hello, welcome back to Quark Talk. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Crystal, and this is a relaunch of my show, Quark Talk. This time it's going to be kind of a limited series with a focus on the culture of women. And we're going to unpack that as we go along. But today I'm very, very happy to be having the co-initiators, including myself, in the creation of this international women's group at the EWCPA, and that's that UH Manoa, because we're all grad students too. So there are a lot of layers we're going to unpack, but we're going to unpack it with the concept and the focus of feminine hygiene, as in how how do cultural backgrounds and perspectives influence the way we view um, and approach our bodies? And how important is it to talk about something like this that seems uh, taboo, but actually everybody has to deal with it? It's actually very ordinary um, issues that we bring to the table and hope you'll join us in this discussion of the culture of feminine hygiene. So at this point, let me introduce my two lovely guests, uh, co-initiators. So we've got next to me is Haley. Haley is a grad student. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? and then? We'll yeah, so I'm a master's student at mm -hmm. UH Manoa in the Department of Second Language Studies, and my research focus is on feminist language pedagogy. Okay. So yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And next is Som. Thank you, I'm Som. Um, I'm also a grad student at UH Manoa uh, in public administration, and my research focuses in domestic violence in Mongolia. So you said that. So Psalm is from Mongolia, and Haley, you spent time in Paris, and you are from? Yes, I'm originally from uh, the Chicago area, but I lived for four years in the south of France. Okay, yeah. so we do indeed have an international group here. And uh, how do you feel? Let's talk about the International Women's Group first. Yeah. How did this all come about? Yeah. Um, well, I know for, for me, so yeah. we're part of the International Women's Group. It's uh, EWCPA, which is East-West Center Participants Association, because we all live at East-West Center. Um, and I have always been interested in women's issues. Obviously, it's something that I study and I'm very invested in. Um, but I was thinking about, you know, what could I do? And that there really wasn't a physical space for me to invest in. Because I think, you know, in our daily lives, we sort of inhibit these micro-level spaces. So I don't know where you live, where your classroom, where you go to school, your bathroom, I don't know, right? When you go to the grocery store. Um, but these are all affected by these sort of macro level institutions that we live in. So social, educational, economic institutions. And when I was thinking about it, you know, most of these macro level institutions are male dominated. <laughs> um, and I think that has a real trickle down effect. And if we want to subvert that in any way, we need to have female dominated spaces in our micro level spaces in our life in order to affect that. And so I wanted to create a space within East West Center and within our community where that could happen. OK, cool. A space is important. So Sam, what is your take on this important yeah, space? Yeah, to me, it was, um, it was all about the creating this space where um, we feel comfortable mm -hmm. just on sharing, you know, regardless of genders. So our, our focus uh, with this group is we don't want to be exclusive on one gender. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to make it as inclusive as possible. Mm -hmm. And just the idea of having this space where everyone feels comfortable, that's what uh, really drove me to initiate this yeah. project with you girls. Yeah, so this is a very recently launched uh, uh, organization. But we hope to provide a platform to talk about things that seem sensitive and inappropriate to talk about, but are actually really important. So we start with this concept of feminine hygiene because every female has to deal with it. Every female has a vagina. I don't know why that's a taboo word, too. Mm, like, people right. get all cringy when we talk about the, ah, oh, you know, when I talk <laughs> about that. Mm -hmm. and, and everybody, every woman has menstrual, well, not everybody, most women, we you know, we have um, menstruation, we have cycles, and we have to deal with it. And so we're bringing on the table these issues of uh, products that actually re kind of are a big part of our life. Huge part. I mean, if you don't mind me sharing some, like the other day we're meeting, you're like asking me for a tampon during yeah. break time because these are like part of our lives. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about that. How were, how did you all uh, get educated, or how did you learn about the ways of dealing with feminine hygiene when you were growing up? Mm -hmm. Well, um, um, I was born and raised in Mongolia. Yeah. So it was a communist society, and turned into um, we ha had a democracy just in 1990. So um, if I think back on my story, uh, it was actually my dad who educated me. He, so, okay. yeah, when I was 12, first period, it was my dad who was 
telling me all about it. He was welcoming me to adult life. Oh. You know, so um, it was both the contribution of um, my both parents, male and female. So mm -hmm. um, to me, I think that really made me feel comfortable uh, to talk openly about it mm -hmm. to men too. Um, but there's a lot of influence from society. Mm -hmm. Growing up in a private school in Mongolia, also going to public school in Mongolia, there's a lot of stereotyping where, um, I'll talk about an example, where you have to get checked. Um, there's a health education process in public schools in Mongolia where girls and boys are separated, where they have to, they can't talk about biology when they're together right. back in 2000 mm -hmm. or uh, late 1990s. So that kind of um, stereotyping leads to stigma. You know what I mean? Okay. So there's not only family education, there's also society influence where as a young girl, you tend to observe that and start feeling sensitive about t talking openly about your period. Mm -hmm. You tend to start buying tampons or pads and you hide it, you know? I still see a lot of those around. So there's a lot of um, environment influence where we feel like we have to hide it, that mm -hmm. we can't talk about it mm -hmm. openly. Do you feel that way in the West, Haley? Um, in my personal experience, a little, mm. but my experience is, yeah, um, I'm lucky because, so I have a wonderful supportive family and my mom is really the one who educated me about feminine hygiene primarily. And it was because she had a really negative experience actually, yeah, I remember her telling me mm. that when she first got her period, she thought she was dying. Wow. Because she non didn't really get any mm. formal education from anyone and she didn't know what was happening. It so. wasn't in the school system to know at least yeah, about Yeah, and I don't worked. think, you know, her and her mom talked about it too much. And so she really made sure to, to talk to me and to my sister about it. And so then when I got my period, I felt like, you know, I was sort of prepared and I was ready. But there was still this sort of taboo feeling around mm -hmm. needing to sort of keep it secret and hide yeah. it, right? So like wrapping up my tampon or my pads and toilet paper right. to so make sure my that? brothers don't see it. So I think, you know, I was actually, uh, I think it was actually my mom, but you know, she was doing it unconsciously. Yeah. She's just, you know, when she's showing me, you know, how to deal with these products, right. make sure you wrap it up, you yeah. know, no one sees it in the trash can. But I, I'm lucky too. Is that a cultural thing? Sorry for Yeah, I don't know. Is because it, do you wrap yeah, tampons and exactly? pads in Mongolia? Because in China, what I've heard, and I think I hope that it's been a little bit uh, modernized, is that people in the villages would throw their pads out like on the rooftops and they'd be like disgusting displays of things like that. Mm -hmm. And it was because it's culturally, it was just not something that you were taught to do. And, you know, that's a practice and it's not trying to be inappropriate or disgusting. It's just something that we weren't, that they weren't taught. Yeah. So, yeah, again, I think that's a practice of how, yeah, where do you, where do you learn about these things? Mm -hmm. If your parents or sisters or brothers can't teach you that, yeah. how do you learn? And is there an so inappropriate it's... way to learn? Because like if, you know, sex is all on the internet, right? right. Everyone learns through porn, unfortunately. Like these younger people who, who are, their, their knowledge of sexuality and, and sexual practices is, is so misguided because of these online sources. But for feminine hygiene, there's not really that movement going on. People yeah, don't like don't post like, hey guys, this is the, uh... right. <laughs> in fact, Saul told me this new site, if you want to talk about that new site about these oh, organic yeah. tampons. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I found out about Cora. So it's um, initiated by a female social entrepreneur, and they're actually creating this platform where you have access to getting tampons and pads delivered to your home. Mm. And they're also, um, they're a nonprofit. They're trying to also um, empower 300 million women out there who just simply don't have access. Yeah. And uh, about 25 million girls, they just miss school because they, they're on their period. They can't, they can't afford. So this whole um, social enterprise, it's um, investing mm. into educating mm -hmm. girls all around the world, specifically in a lot of um, Central American uh, countries and throughout India. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just, um, it just made me think about this yeah. in a different way mm -hmm. because uh, we're very selective on what's important and mm -hmm. what's not important. And it seems like... This is something hidden. It's just yes, not. exactly. But and it's this, highly re yeah. related to health education. Mm -hmm. Right. It's mm -hmm. related to poverty. Right. It's yes. not only about empowerment. Right, right. It's our social problem too. Mm -hmm. And why do we keep hiding it? Why do we keep putting on the And no, we're not talking about it. Like we were talking about um, refugees, immigrants, people who are under underprivileged or impoverished or homeless. I mean, 
if they don't have the means to access products, feminine hygiene products, how do they deal with it? You know, we're, we take for granted. We're like, okay, yeah, let me borrow a tampon mm -hmm. from a friend. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. what about people who don't have access? I mean, right. we think about that, what it means. It's kind of a, an important, understated uh, issue that's kind of swept under the rug, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's not like titled as a social issue, but it is if you think yeah, about definitely. it. And because we have the privilege, we don't really think about mm -hmm. what's going on around, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's statistically 300 million women who just simply don't have the access. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. So that makes you see it as yeah. a, from a different perspective. Yeah. And um, it's important that we talk about it openly. And it's it's really, um, it was really inspiring to see such organizations exist, yeah. taking it and um, Talking right. about it. Yeah, you know? and it's a really nice website, so you should check it out. <laughs> um, on the aspect of the importance of different cultural aspects, I want to bring in the, uh, you know, the concept of why it's taboo. Why, mm -hmm. why, why you know, Sam, you mentioned it before. Um, there's a taboo of uh, a lot of Asian countries, I don't know about others, uh, of not using tampons as opposed to sanitary pads, because the concept of inserting something is not um, appropriate. But when the Western perspective would be, that's that's the cleanly way to do it, right? Right? Yeah. People would argue that the pads are the older band-aids, which sounds really disgusting. Mm -hmm. But the tampons were mm. something that were inappropriate. You want to? Mm. What do you want to um, elaborate on that? Yeah. So um, to our culture, it was um, we would hear myths, a lot of misconception that. Uh, if you use tampons, it's going to destroy your virginity, for instance. Have you heard of that before, really? Like, you know, uh -huh. I've heard someone talk about it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. It's, it's mm -hmm. pretty, it just, yeah. it, it's a way that um, young girls can think, oh, so this means this is a no to tampons all mm -hmm. along, you know? So there's all, there's, um, there's marketing going on there, too, behind yeah, this. Sure. <laughs> um, and I guess there's a, um, and I heard this from a lot of my international girlfriends, too, uh, there's the same. There's the same um, differences that that actually make you select different types of products based on these misconceptions and myths. Ah. Uh, and it's all about the access now. But times times changed. Well, in my culture, in my country, now there's access. There's a lot of access to different types of products. So would you say Diva most cups. modern girls wear use tampons more than pads now, or it's still kind of fixated in the old traditional way of mm. using pads? I think my um, practice changed when I went to school in Connecticut. So oh, okay. yes. um, as a 16-year-old girl, being introduced to tampons there, um, because all my girlfriends use tampons. So who taught you I was you the to only use? one using Haley, pads. You, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is very personal to ask people whether they use pads or tampons. But is it assumed no, that okay. most people use tampons? <laughs> you know, I think so. I think I was a, a late starter on tampons, though, because it actually kind of scared me. Mm -hmm. I, I was sort of scared See, by the idea of using a tampon. But that wasn't right? on the cultural but taboo thing for you. It was just no. And so it was my mom who eventually taught me and showed me how to use they tampons. But most okay. of my girlfriends were using tampons, right? And that's okay. why I, I wanted to. And there was this idea that they were cleaner and they were easier. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if I necessarily agree. I've sort of gone away from tampons now. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't like, like them as much. Really? Yeah. But then, see, yeah. Crystal, in China, you said it's the other way around. Tampons are not considered clean. Mm. Well, and then again, how do we define? Yeah. It? Yeah. I mean, now I think the more modern girls will use tampons more than pads, and I guess it depends on your lifestyle too, right? Right. Um, you know, if you're an athlete, obviously you would probably have to use a tampon. Yeah. And for me, the reason why I actually made the shift it was interesting. It was because um, so when I was living in France and I was teaching at a school there, the they didn't have any um, they didn't have any garbage cans in the bathroom. Oh, yeah, that's inconvenient. There were no garbage cans in the so bathroom, and you I asked it about up? it. Well, so yeah, so I would have to like, if I was wearing a tampon, I'd have to like roll it up and yeah. like put it in like my backpack. Yeah, or and my then purse. you forget about it. Yeah, until you <laughs> find the garbage can. Oh. And so then I just started wearing pads again because you know I could leave it in longer. It sounds gross, right? But I, I didn't have to worry <laughs> about it. We're like a tampon. You have to take it out when you know when it's full. You have but to. But that's take education it out. too, because a lot right. of people don't know that. Like I, I have to remind my daughter because she mm -hmm. uses tampons and she can leave it in for a long time. Like yeah. that is not healthy. Right. And there are problems with that and you have to re you have to <laughs> clean yourself yeah. up every uh, few hours so these like little kind of um, practicalities uh, and and things that we don't think about discussing but they are they affect our bodies and how we view our bodies is based on what we use to uh, treat our bodies so we're going to take a small break um, 
hold that thought about this tampon pad kind of <laughs> debate and, and what you read into that in your cultural perspective of how you view this. It's really quite interesting. So we'll be back, so don't go away. Aloha, I want to invite all of you to Talk Story with John Wahei every other Monday here at Think Tech Hawaii. And we have special guests like Professor Colin Moore from the University of Hawaii who joins us from time to time to talk about the political happenings in this state. Please join us every other Monday. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Welcome back to Clock Talk. I'm Crystal here with my two wonderful guests from the International Women's Group at EWCPA, Haley and Psalm. Now, we were talking about the uh, myths of the uh, tampons and how culturally, and even just in terms of how we perceive things, is um, in fact quite sensitive because it's the idea of inserting something that may seem inappropriate depending on, and it's like it's an awkward thing. You have to kind of figure out how to do it right. Because, you know, this is another technical thing. If you don't insert it right, right. if you had it where you don't insert it all the way and it feels like something's like or it hurts it, it's yeah, it angle, can't, it feels yeah. off yeah. <laughs> so there's a detail right. but um, speaking of insertion I think um, we need to also talk about the taboos of uh, sexual practices while women menstruate because again I don't know if it's cultural or maybe it's a personal thing. How do you girls feel about that? Um, yeah. Sex during the period, that, that's like, whoa, we can't right. be talking about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> well, I think my visions, uh, my, my idea of sex during period has changed, right? Um, over the years with the uh, people that I've been with. So originally I thought, you know, I thought no way, like, no, no one ever talked about that, right? So I was lucky because my parents did talk to me about, you know, menstruation and feminine hygiene, but nobody ever talked about sex yeah. and menstruation, right? right? Like, that's not something we see anywhere. Mm. And so I just had this idea, like, oh, that's disgusting. Like, no guy's going to want to be with me. No guy's going to want to touch me when I'm menstruating. Right. And it's so wrong. <laughs> it's not true. Well, because your every, hormones are elevated. Yeah. And there's something and every, very heated. And you know what? Every guy I've ever been with, if I've been on my period and I'm just like, oh, I don't know, you know, I'm on my period, he's like, I don't care. And That's it's great. it's been fine. And yeah, yeah I don't know. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. us. It's us that we think this right. is We have It's in our own heads that it's yeah. not okay. But it's natural. It's something natural. I mean, and I don't know. Most guys seem to understand that. And don't seem to mind too much. Yeah. How much do you think that, that guys that you know understand how the woman's body really works? Mm. See, I think that would help, though, having sex during your period. <laughs> probably right. helps them understand yeah. a little bit. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Mm. Um, I think it depends on, on their experiences, probably, with the women in their lives. Um, I know. So I have two uh, brothers. Right. And my sister and I, we, we try to talk with our brothers about it. Like, we don't hide it, right? When we're on our periods, we're like, oh man, I have cramps, and like, good. you know, like, I feel like this, and I'm bleeding, and um, so I think they they understand. I think they really, they, they get it a lot better, uh -huh. uh, because they've had the chance to talk with us, and that's why it's so important that we talk about these topics, yeah. right? Because how can men understand if we don't tell right. them about it? Right. Um, and right. it is important for them to understand. So, so how do, like, mm. parents even educate their sons about mm. this process mm -hmm. on a woman's body? Yeah. It's kind of interesting. Tom, you're a mom. Yeah. Yes, yeah. so you have two. You have a son. I still have time. Yeah. <laughs> Talk to them exactly. Yeah, I still have that. time. But yeah, let's. Um, you know, when I when I talk with my um, male friends, uh, it seems like majority um, they don't really talk about. Yeah. Mm. They don't really get education from their mothers. Or you know, I have to they, say, confess, I've never talked about friends. it to my boys either. Yeah, boys, yeah. In fact, I'm going to try mm -hmm. tonight to ask mm -hmm. them what they think or know about the yeah. situation. Yeah, but I think when my time comes, when my son's older, yeah. Um, I think I would definitely jump in and um, yeah. talk openly about this. And, and to respect that, to yeah. Right. You know what I think the biggest taboo is for men, is they think that, oh, is that time of the month? Oh, okay, so if she's grumpy or she's a little bit crazy, stay away. That's the, the, I, the, I hate that. I hate yeah, it when there's that presumption. Yeah. 
Um, you know, and, maybe one thing would be in schools. So I don't yeah. know how you guys learned, but when we had um, like education, I remember when I was like in fifth and sixth grade about like puberty and stuff. Mm -hmm. They always separated the guys. Yeah, and they girls, still do, right? They yeah. still do. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, what if it was done together? Yeah, good point. Mm. You're well, in yeah. pedagogy. I mean, this is like, <laughs> like, like, like why not? It. And I don't know, maybe, I don't know if it would make kids uncomfortable, but um, I mean, like, why are they uncomfortable, right? Like, why in the first place are they uncomfortable learning about the other sex? Exactly. And learning mm. about what happens. And why is it shunned? Like, I mean, right. the, again, going back to the cultural thing, um, back in the old days, the red tent, the concept mm -hmm. of how women um, in Israel had to go into this tent and kind of spend their time there when they're menstruating. But you think about it, it might have stemmed from something very practical, that they didn't have mm -hmm. sanitary napkins right. and they had to stay put and they couldn't do any right. other work. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I mean, what are your... Well, when we talk about misconception, mm -hmm. um, I found it interesting that, you know, the one best thing about having International Women's Group is that you get to interact with a lot of people from different cultures. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I learned that misconceptions aren't always negative. It was also about embracing, embracing this biology that we have, mm. this nature. Um, and then there's a lot of misconceptions that's um, myths, I would say myths, um, that when women are menstruating, um, there are things like, oh, you can't, you, you can't stay in the kitchen because your taste buds changed. Hey, don't drink okay. lemonade. In which culture? In Poland. In, in Poland? Poland, Poland? <laughs> yes. In Poland, um, there's a myth that, um, oh, you're going to kill your partner. If, you, if you have sex while you're menstruating. No uh, and in the Philippines, uh, you can't be around the kitchen. Mm. Uh, and also in Italy, uh -huh. you can't cook because you're going to destroy everything. So it's, you know, it's <laughs> well, I can to that the because And there's also the idea of, um, in lots of Hispanic culture, mm -hmm. uh, you can't drink lemonade. So mm -hmm. it, 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 it kind of relates to maybe there's, it's not always about negative things. It's about taking care of women, giving them break. Okay, mm -hmm. I see that. Okay. But I, you know, from my Chinese culture and my experience living in Hong Kong is, I saw more of the negative side of it. I mean, I, I wish they kind of like respected to say, okay, you rest for these next five days. No, if anything, like in the film industry, if they, if you had your period, not that you would announce it, but they say that, Women can't sit on camera boxes, basically. Any equipment, because women, because they bleed, are deemed as bad omens and mm. can create like a bad right. luck to something. Yeah. And, and it's like, wow. So I know? think, yeah, like the problem with a lot of these myths then is that it's still treating having a period as a deficiency, right? And mm -hmm. that there's something wrong with you in some way. So even if it is, you know, like, oh, you can't go in the kitchen, so then, I don't know, you can't cook, and I don't know, you have a, you have a break, you're still being viewed as deficient in some way. Like, why can't you be in there? It's not go have a rest, you know. It's there's something wrong with you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you think in our modern times that we find ways to question these or, or balance the traditions and where it comes from with the modern kind of concepts of how we need to take care of ourselves. I mean, what do you think? Where, where do we draw the line on accepting old traditions that actually may affect how we are viewed in society and all that? Mm. Mm. I think it takes time. Just, you know, just we're, we're talking about this openly. Maybe perhaps 10 years ago, we wouldn't be sitting here and talking openly about female hygiene products mm. and period. Um, but so I guess it takes time and it takes a lot of, um, um, when you're exposed to diversity, where you uh, in, interact with different groups of people, I think that really helps to make you think differently on things because your values change in life. Mm. So does your perception and misconceptions as well. So I think it takes time and it takes this. We gotta talk talk about talk. this. Mm -hmm. This is this is a big contribution to and breaking to down the learn about things. You mm. just mentioned today, just learned that you said that uh, I think is it in Japanese culture that Japanese women aren't encouraged to make sushi when they have their period. Yes, that, that was one of them. Yeah. it affects their, is it their taste buds? That it affects their... It's taste their... buds. See, it's related to a lot of nutrition <laughs> yeah, stuff, too. Yeah. I don't know. I and mean, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of myth where uh, behavioral restrictions were, you can't wash your hair throughout the week oh. of menstruation. Um, well, in my country, 
uh, we have to stay warm. Yes. So, yeah. so it's not always negative stuff. It's yeah. also about embracing woman's body too. Yeah, yeah. I tell mm. my daughter, don't eat cold things when you have your period. See, that's coming from your <laughs> Chinese roots. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> because there is, you have to understand the um, openness, you have the vulnerability when you have your period, and I guess that vulnerability kind of opens up to a really bigger kind of concept of this conversation, doesn't it? Like, yeah. why are we as women vulnerable? Because we can menstruate. Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? And vulnerability is not a bad thing at all. Right. Uh -huh. mm. Mm -hmm. We're embracing it. How is it a form it? of resistance? <laughs> exactly. It is. It, mm, it's not oppositional. Vulnerability <laughs> is not oppositional to resistance. Right. That's what mm -hmm. feminist theory tells us. <laughs> <laughs> so in our kind of a wrap up of all these kind of like um, different attitudes and perceptions on on these things, what do you feel like you we need to kind of give as a takeaway to this topic of feminine hygiene? Yeah. I think for me it's mostly education, just because I'm an educator, right? And so I do think we need to find ways uh, to educate children, especially, right? To, How early do you think that comes? That's you know, I think question. when you start, well, I mean, it could start at the home too, right? Like yep. if you, like a kid finds, I don't know, like a box of tampons and they're yeah, what is this, like, mommy? Why can't you just tell them, like, exactly. oh, it's a tampon and like, you know, tell them what it's for, right? Mm -hmm. So. So making it less taboo in that sense, but also in schools when you start with sex education too, I think there are a lot better ways that mm. we could talk about this and discuss it together. Yeah, um, I think the together yeah. thing's key. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's really a good point. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Song? Well, speak, I'll speak as a mother of a boy and a girl. Um, so it's about it's about starting beginning with with within the family. So um, first thing, just got to be open about this. It's okay that um, boys talk about period. Boy, boys can listen to their mother about female bodies, and I think that's um, that's a very good beginning for um, breaking this negative misconceptions mm -hmm. and behavioral restrictions that make women seem vulnerable that they need help. No, it's just about embracing it. So I think as a mother, it begins within the family. Mm. But we just we just have to be very open about this. Yeah, mm. yeah. So I think we opened up a really great platform to talk about these sensitive issues, and it's just the beginning of many to come. Um, and if you have any uh, ideas of some sensitive feminine, uh, not feminine, but just women's issues on gender or sensitivities of how socially and culturally we seem to kind of block things that are so called taboo or inappropriate, um, text us and call us and email us uh, at ThinkTech too, so that we can discuss and open up this conversation to people and make it a healthy, healthy conversation about sensitive issues. So uh, I want to thank both of my guests today, Haley and Saul, for talking and bringing up the International Women's Group. And congratulations to us, I have to say, yeah. on creating a platform for this, because it's really important. Yeah. Um, and uh, tune in again, and we'll be talking about more sensitive uh, issues, but highlighting and supporting and celebrating the culture of women. Thank you, and see you next time.